Thanks to all of you for coming. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here and to share with you a little bit of the survey work uh, that we do at the Pew Research Center, both in the United States and in Europe as well. Um, as you probably know, it's, a, it's an exciting political time in the United States. Uh, we are finally going to have our election uh, in less than two weeks now after a very long campaign. I think, I think we certainly have to have the longest campaigns in the world in the U.S. It, it goes on for quite a long time. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the data that we c have collected on the U.S. election, and, but also talk a lot about a polling we've done on both sides of the Atlantic uh, and, and looking at some of the factors that I think are, are, are driving the populism uh, both in Europe and in the United States and some of the similarities that we see. Uh, there are differences as well, of course, and you know, during the discussion period I'd love to hear from all of you about you know, what you think you see in terms of similarities or differences between the U.S. and Europe. Um, and I'll, I'll uh, share with you some slides that kind of highlight all of these findings. Uh, before I do that, let me give you just a little bit more information about the, the Pew Research Center so you know a little bit more about uh, who we are and what we do. We're essentially a think tank uh, based in Washington, D.C. We've been around 20 years now. Um, we get most of our funding from the Pew Charitable Trust, which is a large philanthropic organization in the United States. Uh, you give us most of the money, that, you know, that, that's where the name comes from. Uh, we do get money from other uh, foundations at times. We've been funded for the, from the Gates Foundation, for example, to do some survey work in Africa, you know, other major uh, foundations. As it, says, as it says here, we're nonprofit, uh, nonpartisan, we are non-advocacy, so uh, we don't take positions on policy debates. We don't make policy recommendations. We actually like to call ourselves, as it says here, a, uh, a fact tank rather than a think tank. Uh, we do think, uh, but uh, we, 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 we put such an emphasis on data, on information, on empirical research, and we don't, you know, as I said, make policy recommendations, things like that, that are really the, the heart and soul of what a lot of other think tanks do. So that differentiates us a little bit. Um, since, in, since we've been doing international surveys since 2002, we've now been in 93 different countries all over the world, um, and I'm hopeful we'll be able to add a couple more to that list over the next year or so. And I'll put a plug in for the website. It's uh, pewresearch.org. Um, all our reports are there, uh, op-eds, blog posts, a lot of interactive features that I think are, are very useful. And all the raw data is there uh, as well. So, you know, if you're working on a research project, you're working on a paper, uh, and you want to try to use some survey data, you can go to our website, download it, use it uh, in SPSS uh, and, and, you know, for your own research and your own purposes. So we love it when people in the academic community use our data. Um, so let me start off by talking a little bit about the U.S. political landscape um, and, and, and what we're seeing in terms of the 2016 election cycle. So the first slide just gives you an overview of the presidential race. And uh, I should note this, this is not Pew Research Center data here. This is from a website called Real Clear Politics that takes an average of many national polls that are done. So this is their kind of rolling average over the last few months on the vote choice between Clinton and Trump. So, you know, as you can see, it's moved around a little bit. Go back to July, uh, Clinton was in the lead. Um, the, the one moment where Trump led was right after the Republican convention. But then uh, the Democrats had their convention, which, you know, most think went pretty well for Hillary Clinton. So she regained the lead. Um, she's maintained the lead ever since. It dips down a little bit in the early fall. But uh, we've had three presidential debates now in recent weeks, which, you know, polling would suggest have gone pretty well for her, and her lead has expanded again. But, you know, it's still, still a somewhat close race, um, and, you know, we'll keep seeing what happens again. We, we still have a little bit more to go, but right now the polls would suggest a lead for Clinton. Uh, now, one of the things that's true in this election cycle is that both candidates are pretty unpopular. Uh, they have high, un high unfavorable, you know, high negative ratings. And this uh, chart kind of points at that in a way. Um, we asked Donald Trump supporters, what's the main reason you're voting for him? We asked Clinton supporters, what's the main reason you're voting for her? So the top answer for Trump supporters is that he is not Clinton. 
Um, top answer for Clinton supporters is that she is not Trump. So, um, you know, a lot of people are casting their votes not so much because they're thrilled about the candidate they're voting for, but they really don't like the opponent, right? So that's driving them, that's driving their vote choice. And that reflects, again, an unhappiness that many people have about the two major party nominees. Now, um, one of the things that uh, is working generally in favor of Democrats is the changing composition of the American electorate. So here you can see uh, changes in the, since the year 2000 um, of, of the eligible voter population in the United States by race and ethnicity. And as you can see, the percentage white uh, has gone down, you know, fairly steadily over the last 16 years. Uh, the per percentage African American stayed about the same, and the percentage Hispanic has almost doubled, percentage Asian has doubled over these last uh, 16 years. So uh, the American electorate is becoming more diverse, and as I said, that kind of long-term trend works in favor of Democrats because minority groups tend to vote Democratic more than Republican. So yeah, this is something that's going to continue. The American electorate, because of demographic patterns, is going to keep getting more diverse in the coming years. Another trend that uh, works to the favor of Democrats <coughs> is the changing generational composition of the American electorate. So this shows you uh, in, in millions the number of voters per generation over time going back to 1996. So if you kind of want to walk through these uh, from oldest to youngest, the oldest generation, and, oops, sorry, I guess, that, I guess that's sensitive there, sorry. Um, the oldest generation uh, are the, the silent generation or what's called in the U.S. the greatest generation, folks who grew up during the Great Depression, during World War II. Obviously these are, these are older uh, people, so they're, you know, they've passed away, they're becoming a smaller part of the electorate. Next would be the baby boomer generation, people born in the couple of decades after World War II, um, declining a little bit, but still hovering around 70 million people. Then the, the next oldest is Generation X, that's, uh, that's my generation, that's people who were born somewhere between, say, the mid-1960s and the early 1980s. And then you've got the millennials, right? Uh, and here defined, I believe, as people born 1981 or later. Um, and, you know, the first uh, election they were eligible to vote in was 2000, and then they've been growing and growing and growing ever since. So, you know, just about at parity with uh, baby boomers at this point. And this, this, again, is a trend that works in favor of Democrats. Often millennial voters, younger voters are more supportive of Democrats. They've been uh, a big part of President Obama's base, certainly in the 2008 election, 2012 election. And, you know, one question for Election Day for Hillary Clinton is, will these young voters turn out for her or not? Uh, young voters don't always turn out to vote at high rates. So a big question for her is, you know, if she's not as popular among these voters as Obama was, how many of them are going to show up and vote for her uh, on November 8th? So we'll see what the answer is soon. Another factor probably working in Clinton's favor is that President Obama's approval ratings have been going up a little bit uh, in recent months. Here you can, if you look at the left side of the screen, you can see his approval ratings over time. You know, of course, like many uh, elected officials, starts out very popular. The honeymoon wears off and his numbers dropped a little bit uh, over time. And you can see they, they kind of moved around a bit, uh, you know, over the years and then have increased some. Um, in, in recent months. Still not huge, 53 percent approval is not a, an overwhelming number, but it has been tracking upwards. If you look at the right side, you can see that this growth in his approval rating has been taking place among Democrats and independents, you know, not among Republicans. And of course, if you look at that right side too, you can see uh, just one of many examples of how polarized the American electorate is, right? Consistently very high ratings form among Democrats, very low ratings for President Obama over time among Republicans, independents in the middle. You know, lots of issues like that in, in U.S. politics that we see this huge polarization between uh, Democrats and Republicans. So now let's look at some of these issues, um, again, on, on both sides of the Atlantic, uh, and many of which I think are, are sources of 
this populist sentiment that we, we know is growing in many countries. Um, and one of the things that we see is that in different ways, I think, people see their countries in some form of decline. Um, this is a question we ask in the U.S. Um, compared with 50 years ago, do you think life for people like you is better or worse or about the same? And overall, you know, 47% of Americans say um, worse, 36% say better, 13% say the same. But as you can see, there are huge differences between Clinton supporters and, and Trump supporters. About 6 in 10 Clinton supporters say better. 81% of Trump supporters say that life for people like me is worse than it was 50 years ago. And, you know, if you think about Donald Trump, you, you may have seen it, his campaign slogan is, Make America Great Again, right? And in some ways, it's, it, it plays right into this sentiment that people have, this sort of sense of loss, this sense that life for people like me isn't as good as it was half a century ago. So, you know, Trump has tapped into that existing sentiment among a certain constituency in the United States, and that's one reason why they've been very receptive to his message. Something else. Um, that I think is important, and again we see this in the U.S. Uh, as well as in Europe, is a sense of um, econom economic anxiety about the future, in particular the long-term future. So this is a question we asked all over the world in a 40-country survey we conducted last year. Uh, do you think that uh, when children in our country today grow up, they're going to be financially better off or worse off than their parents? So in Latin America, Africa, Asia, people tend to say they think that children are going to be better off than their parents. In the Middle East, and especially in the United States and Europe, people tend to say they think that children are going to be worse off. So, you know, to me this is an important question because it, it, it gets into, um, it, it sort of taps into the fact that it's not just the current economic conditions people are worried about. It's not just the current economy that looks bad to them. It's that long-term economic pic picture that they're worried about. And that's an even deeper sense, I think, of, of economic anxiety that people feel. And again, this is something we see you know, not just in the U.S., but in the Europe as well. There's a, a foreign policy uh, aspect of decline as well. Um, and you can see a bit of that in this question that we've asked for a long time. Uh, other survey research organizations have asked going back to the mid-1970s. Compared with 10 years ago, do you think the U.S. is less important and powerful than it used to be, as important and powerful, or more important and powerful? And as you can see, again, we've got you know, a, a 40 plus year trend on this. And the last few times we've asked it, we've gotten um, you know, numbers that are at or near all time highs in terms of the percentage of people who say the U.S. is less important and powerful than it was a decade ago. So again, this, this taps into the sense that um, in terms of the foreign policy world and America's role in world affairs, we're in relative decline. We're not the strong power that we once were. Certainly you hear a lot of this on the campaign trail. Now, this year we asked a similar question for the first time in Europe, and we see um, similar findings in, in some countries at least. Um, you know, in, in Greece, Italy, Spain, France, UK, you've got four in ten or more saying we think that we're less important, not a lot of people saying more important. Now, in Hungary is interesting. You get, um, you know, pretty equal numbers on less important and more important. So, you know, actually more people here saying we're, so, so, sorry, uh-oh, okay, oh, okay, let's try to go back there. Got to remember not to touch that. Um, uh, so here you've got one of the larger percentages of, of people saying um, more important. Now the two countries that really stand out are, are Poland, uh, where you've got a 45% plurality saying more important, and then especially Germany, right? 62%, the one place you've got a majority saying we're playing a more important role than we were a decade ago. And I think that would fit in with what a lot of people uh, think has happened to, in Germany in terms of its certainly its economic role, also its diplomatic role is probably playing a bigger role in world affairs. And the German public seems to recognize that. Now, how they feel about it is a, is a different question. We, we need to ask some questions about that too, I think. But they recognize at least that their country is playing this more important role.
Can I ask what's yeah. how do you explain to Poland? You know, I, I don't know. I mean, I'd be interested to know what some of, some of you think. I mean, you know, maybe they sense that they've, they've weathered the storm economically, at least early, in the early years of the crisis, better than others. Maybe it's the rising sense of nationalism there is leading people to feel like, okay, we're playing this more important role. Those would be hypotheses. I don't know that either one of those is the right answer, but that would be, you know, that would be my hypothesis, I guess, about what might be driving it. Um, but, you know, in, in many countries, we see, of course, a lot of people saying we're kind of playing this less important role, which is what we see in the U.S. Um, you know, perceived threats, uh, in particular, as they're tied to views of minorities, this is something we see, um, you know, in, in European countries and in the U.S. in some ways. Certainly in terms of, of threats, um, you know, big international threats, it's, it's ISIS that is the top perceived threat both in the U.S. and in just about all the European countries we surveyed. Uh, we read people a list of potential threats in the survey we conducted earlier this year, and uh, you can see here, people are concerned about a lot of things, but ISIS uh, tops the list in the U.S., and I believe it topped the list in nine of the ten European countries we surveyed. I think global economic instability was the number one threat in Greece, and aside from that, ISIS was the top everywhere. So people concerned about ISIS more broadly, they're concerned about the issue of terrorism once again. Um, and many see a link between, you know, the refugee issue and terrorism. Do you think that, we asked several questions about refugees, including this one, do you think that refugees coming into our country will increase the likelihood of terrorism or not? Um, and Hungary, you know, very high on this one, right? Yes, we think that refugees coming into our country will increase the likelihood of terrorism. Uh, pretty solid majorities in many countries. The exceptions, interestingly, are, are France and Spain. So it's not true that you've got a majority uh, saying we see this link everywhere, uh, but in most countries you do. So, you know, again, this is a link that exists in the minds of many people. Um, it particularly exists on the right of the political spectrum. Now, this is a slightly different question. Uh, this is a percentage of people saying that a large number of refugees leaving countries like Iraq and Syria is a major threat to our country. And, you know, you don't see Hungary up here because it actually is one of the countries where we didn't see a significant difference between right and left. But in many of these countries, you've got significant gaps, you know, 30 points or more in France, the UK, significant gaps elsewhere between right and left on this question, you know, we see pretty big ideological gaps on many of these questions that we ask in Europe. Um, there's also sort of a, a cultural element when you're talking about views of, of minority groups in Europe as well as the United States. This is a question we've asked a few times. Um, do you think Muslims in our country today want to adopt our customs and way of life, or do you think they want to remain distinct from the larger society? Um, and, you know, everywhere you've got a majority of plurality, again, including a pretty significant majority here in Hungary, saying we think that Muslims want to sort of remain distinct from the broader society. So this taps into the sentiment, uh, again, I think it is feeding some of the populism we see, that there are minority groups uh, in the country who don't want to participate in the broader culture. And, you know, that, that sort of t plays into cultural threat perceptions that people perceive, that people feel. Now, in the United States, um, there are some different questions we ask about views towards minority groups and immigration and that whole set of issues. And consistently, you know, this is a, 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 a set of issues where we see very big differences between Democrats and Republicans, very big differences between Clinton supporters and Trump supporters. So uh, it's a lot more difficult to be black in the U.S. than it is to be white. You know, 57% of, of Clinton supporters say yes, uh, just 11% of Trump supporters. You know, this question here, the second one, it gets at um, how much you really sort of value diversity or pluralism in the United States. You know, a 32-point gap on that one between Clinton and Trump supporters. Uh, immigration, you know, that's uh, in, in some ways really the, the issue that Trump launched his campaign on. He got a lot of notoriety right off the bat when he launched his campaign on the issue of immigration. You know, again, very big differences there between Clinton and Trump supporters. Um, this question is part of the government's anti-terrorism efforts. Muslims in the U.S. should be subject to more scrutiny than people of other religions. Fifty-seven percent 
of Trump supporters say yes. Uh, as you know, there's, you know, at times he's talked about banning Muslims coming into the country, applying um, you know, a particular scrutiny to Muslims. Um, just 14% of, of Clinton supporters agree. So on these issues related to minority groups, immigration, that group of issues, huge, huge differences between those who back Trump and those who back Clinton. Um, again, another trend that I think it goes across both sides of the Atlantic in different ways is a lack of faith in institutions. Now, this is a question that we and others have asked going you know, all the way back to the 1950s. Uh, do you trust the federal government to do what's right and always or most of the time? If you go back to the late 1950s, early 1960s, um, huge numbers, you know, up you know, nearly 80 percent saying they trust the federal government. Uh, you know, mid, late 60s, you've got uh, the Vietnam War, uh, you know, getting into the 70s, you've got Watergate, you've got a lot of changes taking place in American society. Trust in government drops dramatically. Goes back up a bit in the 80s, comes down again in, in the early 90s when the economy is struggling. You can see it re recover a little bit and then there's this spike after uh, the 2001 terrorist attacks where there was a bit of a in what we call a rally around the flag effect in American public opinion in the United States. But since then, it's dropped off again, and you know, it's at or near all-time lows when we've asked the question recently. So, um, you know, trust in government at or near an all-time low, you know, going all the way back half a century. We've also asked about trust or confidence in various groups or institutions in the U.S. So, uh, as you can see here, you know, a fair amount of trust or confidence still in the military uh, and scientists to some extent in educational leaders. But if you look down at the bottom of this slide, you can see not a lot of trust in the news media, uh, in business leaders, or in elected officials. And if you think about the rhetoric we've heard on the campaign trail in the U.S., if you've you know, kept up with some of that, you've heard a lot of bashing of all three of those groups, right, in different ways. Um, elected officials have caught a lot of heat, certainly from Donald Trump, you know, to some extent from, from Bernie Sanders too, if you recall his uh, campaign uh, against Hillary Clinton. You know, Bernie Sanders also, of course, was very critical of business leaders, of corporations. Um, and Trump has made a very big point um, of, of, you know, some hostility towards the media, right, especially his campaign events and things like that. So, you know, all of these groups that are low on, on this scale um, are, are catching some heat uh, during this campaign. And again, you know, that sort of rising populist sentiment is, is, is lashing out at different institutions in the United States that, um, that are low on these confidence ratings. Now, on, you know, of course, different type of, of, of institutional trust uh, has been in decline in, in, in Europe. Um, Here's a question about the EU. We've done a lot of work in, in recent years on views about the EU, and this one kind of gets at the, <laughs> the idea of the broader European project and the notion of an ever closer union. Um, do you think you should, we should uh, take some powers back to national governments? Should we keep the balance of power between national governments and Brussels about the same, or should we give uh, more power to Brussels? And as you can see, in most countries, you've got majorities or pluralities saying uh, some, some power should be returned to national governments. Big majority in Greece, 65% in the UK. You know, not, not majorities anywhere else, you know, including uh, here in Hungary, uh, but significant numbers saying we want to bring more power back. Now, this was before Brexit. This was a, a survey conducted in the spring not long before Brexit. So I think it'll be interesting, we're going to go back and, and do another survey soon and ask, and, and how has Brexit affected these, this question? I, I don't know, but it, it'll be interesting to see, I think. Um, but this fits in with a broader pattern, you know, in, in lots of questions we've asked in recent years, and with a lot of, um, you know, skepticism in some ways among some segments of the population, at least, about Europe, the European project. Are you now, surprised that uh -huh. the Hungarian number is so low? Yeah, I mean... I, I, I'm interested to know what, what, what everyone here thinks, but in some ways, uh, we actually thought these numbers might be a little bit higher in many places, maybe including Hungary. Um, so, 
you know, it's a significant number, um, but it's not a majority either. So uh, to me, this will be one of the more interesting questions to track over time. Do we, you know, what impact again does, does Brexit have? But uh, do we see these numbers moving more towards the UK number over time or do people kind of back off and these numbers move in the opposite direction? So I think this will be a good one to trend and, and see what the, the trend tells us. Um, and we, we've also asked some questions, you know, about international affairs and, and particularly on the sort of the notion of global engagement uh, in this most recent survey we did earlier this year. And this question gets at um, the, the idea of engagement versus isolationism. You know, some people don't like the term isolationism, but that's a little bit of what this question sort of measures. Um, do you think our country should deal with its own problems and let other countries deal with theirs as best they can, or do you think we should try to help other countries solve their problems? And you know, if you look down at the bottom here, you can see the median. Um, you know, in general, uh, people tend to say we need to deal with problems here at home. A median across these 10 countries of 56% hold that view. But it does vary a lot from country to country. Greece, here in Hungary, uh, Italy, Poland in particular, you've got pretty substantial majorities saying we need to focus on problems here, not worry about helping other countries. Um, the exceptions in, in some ways are Sweden, Germany, Spain, uh, where you've got slim majorities, not huge majorities, saying we need to help other countries deal with their problems. And, you know, in, in, in several questions, not every question, but in several questions in this year, particularly on foreign, foreign engagement, but other things as well, we, we tend to see the same kind of pattern. Greece, Hungary, Italy, Poland kind of hanging together as a group. Uh, Sweden and Germany, you know, sometimes the Netherlands and Spain hanging together as a group as well. So you know, it's not quite a north-south distinction uh, or an east-west distinction, but we do see similar groupings of countries across a number of different questions we ask. Um, again, you see pretty strong ideological differences, although once again, we, d we don't really see the strong ideological differences here in Hungary, but in many countries, it's people on the right who are especially likely to say, we need to focus on problems here at home, you know, not really worry about uh, working with other countries to solve problems. So if you want to think of that as isolationist sentiment, it tends to be more common on the political right. Same question in the United States, and you know, if you think back to that 56% median we saw across Europe, the U.S. is actually very close to that. 57% say we need to deal with our own problems, let other countries get along as best they can. So the same sort of isolationist tendencies here in the U.S. Um, and we see the same left-right differences here, you know, we see the same left-right differences uh, in the U.S. as well. Um, among Democrats, they're almost evenly divided on this question. Um, you know, independents and uh, Republicans by an almost two to one margin say we need to deal with our own problems. So again, you know, this, this type of sentiment much more common on the right and it's also more common in the middle of the political spectrum in some ways in the U.S. You've got your independents looking on this question at least much more like Republicans. Um, we wanted to to look into different types of engagement in this survey, including economic engagement. So we asked people this question about, and essentially about trade and economic globalization. Do you think uh, global economic engagement is a good thing because it creates new markets and growth, or a bad thing because it lowers wages and costs <laughs> jobs? And in Europe, including uh, here in Hungary, we tend to see majorities saying, uh, we think it's a good thing. Uh, a couple of exceptions, the Italians are basically evenly divided on this one, and the Greeks are not for it. They're, they're against um, uh, globalization, you know, saying that it's a bad thing at, at 57%. Uh, same question in the U.S., and on this question, Americans look more like Italians and Greeks. Uh, by a very slim margin, maybe more likely to say that global economic engagement is a bad thing. Um, now, what, um, this is a slightly different question we asked. The, the free trade agreements specifically uh, between the U.S. and other countries have been a good thing or bad thing for the U.S. And when we ask it this way, uh, we, we've tended to get good thing for the most part over time. But the good thing number has been coming down a little bit. The bad thing number has been on the rise. Um, 
so that's reflecting, you know, glow, uh, growing um, um, anxiety about economic globalization among many Americans. But as you can see in this slide, um, that sort of increasing uh, anxiety about trade, about economic engagement, has been happening on the right. You know, that's where this skepticism about trade has increased very dramatically just in the last year among Republicans. If you look, the percentage of Republicans saying that you know, trade agreements are a bad thing has gone from 39% to 61% in a pretty short period of time. So you know, that, I think, is it reflects some underlying trends that we've been seeing in terms of public opinion on the Republican side. But I think it also reflects the Donald Trump campaign. You know, he has come out and been very strong against trade, or at least against the trade agreements that uh, the U.S. has made with other countries. And uh, the Republican base has, in, in some instances, followed him on those issues. So a big, big change and, and what's been a, a very important issue for Republicans over time. Um, and it's one of the many issues where we're seeing this election cycle, um, the Republican base uh, splitting off and looking uh, very different from the Republican Party establishment, right? If you think of the Republican Party establishment in the United States, it tends to be, you know, business leaders, the, the, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, and you know, groups that are very pro-trade. But, you know, this is one where uh, the, the Republican voters have been moving away from that establishment, and Trump has helped sort of lead them away from the establishment. It's happened on lots of issues, and uh, it means that uh, no matter, you know, who wins the election, I think, um, um, and especially if, if Trump loses, there's going to be an interesting battle within the Republican Party, since you have a lot of tendencies within that party moving in different directions and an increasing gap between sort of Republican Party orthodoxy and the, sta the establishment on the one hand and this growing populist movement on the other hand. Um, so one of many interesting things happening this year in, in the U.S. And like I said, I think there's some similarities between what we see in the U.S. and what we see in Europe. And uh, I'll, I'll stop there, but I'm happy to talk about you know, any of this in more detail or if you have other questions about any of the, w the work that we do at the Pew Research Center, I'm happy to answer those. So thanks very much.